it. Okay. Anyways, I want to welcome you to our Hall of Fame inductions. But before we get to that, I'm going to ask you all a question. And this is something that came up to me. So you know we're all wired differently, but the way I'm wired, I'm an idea guy. I always come up with these crazy ideas. So here's the crazy idea. Hear me out, and you can vote on it at the registration table. And the question is, next year is the 40th, which is a big deal for me. And what I've wondered about doing is, is this is next year the year to do an additional day for Expo? So instead of coming in Wednesday night and tearing him, and tearing would be Tuesday night. Instead of jamming in uh, 40 seminars where there's not a second to breathe, a second to eat, a second to go to the bathroom, you spread out over an additional day. That could happen. So it's just something to think about, but it, uh, it ended my mind. And uh, like any uh, show, you know, as it gets more popular and more things are happening, there's just so many hours in the day, maybe it's time to add another day. So I'd like to hear your idea. I know Martin's not real happy about it, but uh, if you guys would consider it, I appreciate it. Anyway, this is our, our yearly uh, event that we honor those people that have made a contribution to the industry. So if uh, Greg Ferris would come up for it, I could use your help. Thank you. All right. Welcome, everybody. Tonight, I have the privilege to induct Mark Galvez into the Pinball Expo Hall of Fame. Mark? Where are you at, Mark? Come on up, Mark. Or should I say, come on down? <clears throat> I asked uh, Mark's boss, the other art director at Stern, one of many art directors at Stern, Chuck Ernst, to chime in on this induction since Chuck could not attend Expo this weekend. But first, I'll give you my thoughts on Mark. Mark Galvez may be one of the quietest, quietest employees at Stern. I've worked with Mark for just over 10 years now, and I'm still not sure I'd know his voice if I heard him talking down the hall. And that's exactly how he goes about his work, in the most unassuming way, just quietly getting the job done with efficiency and style. A model employee that wouldn't complain if his computer was on fire, he'd just work around the issue. And now a few words from Chuck, and I quote, for those of you who are recent pinball fans or those who may not be familiar with how the pinball sausage is made, Mark Galvez is one of Stern Pinball's senior video artists. His work spans almost two decades. Is it, I gotta fact check this. Is it two decades, Mark, or could it be, no, it's two? Okay. Since, since 2000, Mark says. I, and I, that was Mark, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, uh, Mark is one of Stern Pinball's senior video artists. Okay, uh, I lost my place, I'm sorry. Uh, his early work involved animation on the dot matrix screen, what we at Stern fondly refer to as dots, or the lovely shades of red LED art you see on earlier pins like Tron, ACDC, Ghostbusters, etc. More recently, Mark has added new skills to his toolbox and brings years of animation expertise to the full motion video we now use on current games like Foo Fighters and Venom. Not only has Mark been essential in the creation of these pieces, but in educating our newcomers to the ever-growing video production staff at Stern in the ways of making the sausage of pinball. Let's give it up for Mark Galvez. Welcome to the Pinball Expo Hall of Fame. Oh, wrong one, wrong one. Oh, you gave it to him. Oh, there it is. Welcome to the Pinball Hall of Fame, Mark. Get a picture. Yeah, we're out here in a minute. Nice. 
Thank you. Because they were allowed up here. Oh. Uh, yeah. Uh, one more. One more. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Perfect. All right. Let's read it first and then we'll bring them up. Our next inductee, Mark Wayna. I get to induct I get to induct two marks, two marks in one night. Uh, is this a first? It's a first, ladies and gentlemen, Pitball Expo first. Welcome to the stage. Thank you. All right. I got a few words. So um, this mark is another soft-spoken, low-key, under-the-radar, behind-the-scenes sort of guy, all the while walking around with a MacGyver-style, highly developed mechanical brain. One of those guys who just seems like an old soul. That's not an ageism dig. That is a compliment in the highest regard. I'm pretty sure Mark's soul has been around the block several times in quite a few vehicles. Mark has an amazing amount of interests and hobbies, mostly dealing with mechanical forms of entertainment. Coin-operated games, guitars, music machines, gambling devices, and especially vehicles. And he's also a schooled luthier. Google it. <laughs> and he's been lucky enough to turn those interests into a career in the coin-operated entertainment industry for the past 30 years. In fact, in a past life, he may have worked for a coin-op company in the early 20th century. You never know. Before Mark officially joined the industry at Williams Valley Midway around 1994, he was already an avid collector and restorer of a, of a variety of amusement devices that run on complex mechanical systems. No computers and no software back then, all hardware. I've been lucky enough to see Mark's collection of music machines, including Nickelodeons and Orchestrions, along with an amazing collection of classic mechanical and electromechanical pinball machines, horse racing games, baseball games, trade stimulators, the list goes on and on. His first pinball game that he acquired was Hotline. Before he joined the pinball industry, Mark's love of all things vehicular got him a gig with a prestigious Newman Haas racing team. He spent a number, a number, sorry, no fact checking before writing, how many years? 12. 12 years with them and his love of racing then serendipitously connected him to the team working on a pinball machine called Indy 500 some kind of old soul manifesting going on there. Did you keep a vision board back then, Mark? Just wondering. It's amazing how life's connections happen. Did I mention Mark really digs cars? No, seriously. I'm not sure how many cars Mark has owned or tinkered with since I've known him. But Nick, his son, thinks the list may be around 60 to 70 different cars in total. Not all at once, of course. Nick says Mark enjoys buying unique classics. He's, he's owned a Ferrari, a few Porsches, Fiats, Alfa Romeos, Lotus, currently owns two, and, a, and various race cars like a McNamara Formula Ford, and uh, I, got, I need help with this one, ASA? Is ASA? It? ASA? ASA 1000 GT, be both incredibly rare race cars, many of which, which were in a state of disrepair in need of, lo of loving mechanics touch to bring them back from the dead, which then allows a new enthusiast to benefit from Mark's skills to keep that thing rolling down another road. It takes an old soul like Mark to keep these machines alive so another generation of hobbyists can appreciate their design. But let me get back to the pinball road for a minute. 
Mark was also an integral member of the team that helped Dennis Norman and I create the crazy pinball concoction called Well Nelly Big Juicy Melons. Mark spent countless hours helping to take this idea from zero to 60 by being the mechanical and electrical brain in the room. He also helped on countless games in the Williams days, including Indy 500 and Scared Stiff. After spending time as an apprentice game designer, Mark eventually got a shot to design another favorite theme of his, Godzilla, way before Keith Elwin designed one. Unfortunately, for reasons beyond my recollection or fact checking, that game never saw the light of day. But in later stages of WMS days, Mark did design Cashball, a unique slot machine that included a vertical pinball playfield on top. As you can see, Mark's career choices and avocational pursuits have led him to be a perfect candidate for the Pinball Expo Hall of Fame. He may not have been at the very first Pinball Expo, but he's certainly been a large part of the show since 1990, even before he was in the business. On top of all that, Mark's love of pinball is a family affair. Mark's wife, Barbara, has been an avid competitive player long before bells and chimes was a thing, and his son Nick has made a name for himself in the tournament community and is also working part-time at Stern while finish finishing his degree in Chicago. Mark, my friend and confidant, welcome to the Pinball Expo Hall of Fame. You're welcome. Thank you, everybody. A lot of friendly faces in the room. A lot of you I remember from, you know, 1991, 92, 93, when I was a vendor, a collector like many of you. Um, it's been quite a ride to go from collector and hobbyist to working in the industry, to being out of the industry, to be back in the industry. Um, and now pinball's going as strong as, uh, as it ever has. So uh, thank you all. This is, this is really special, and I really appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> And then there's more. Is Mark Ritchie here? Ah. Hi, everybody. Um, this is, I don't have that kind of win, man. Greg, jeez. Wait, what was that, a 20 minute dissertation on, holy smoke. Well, I'm going to be really brief. Uh, well, I can't be too brief, but I'm here to induct uh, a really good friend of mine and a great musician and composer who has worked on at least 10 of my machines. And I see a lot of people in here who I know that he's contributed to their games as well. So I'm here to uh, talk about Chris Graner. <laughs> So in uh, 1989, I believe it was 1989, I was working on a game called Road Kings, and we had just kind of wore out our sound system that we were running at the time. I think that was designed by Eugene and a couple other people, and man, it was worn out. And Chris came in, and we started to embark on the Yamaha sound chip, which kind of changed everything for us sound-wise. Chris was the first guy to work on that system, on my game. That's the first time it happened. It happened again in 1993 on Indiana Jones with a thing called DCS. Uh, I was a guinea pig for that too. Along with uh, Rich Carstens, Chris created just an amazing uh, sound system, amazing sounds, you know, was able to recreate the feel and the power of Indiana Jones, which I think really contributed to that game, among others, many others. Uh, that probably was the most memorable, exper memorable experience for me. 
But more than that, Chris was a great mentor for me. He would come in early on my game designs. We would talk through the drawing before Chris ever got involved, months before he ever got involved. We would work on concepts and map things out way in advance. Huge help to me all these years. I could go on, but the important thing is this is, this is his honor, and I'm proud to honor Chris and welcome him to the Pinball Hall of Fame. Woo! Barb, Barb, you're right. There's too many of them. So I, so I, 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 I was thinking. I'll just like go around the room and say, Mark Panacho. Right, Elvira, yeah. Fishtails. The 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 background animations on Fishtails on that dot matrix display. I hate the dot matrix display, but Mark made me love it. It was so exciting. Um, there's, I'm, and so that was what I was going to do, but there's too many of you to do that, so I'm not going to do that. Um, but I'm, I'm, um, <clears throat> I, 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 I have to tell, I have to tell this story from this stage. Um, that in 2006, really late 2005, I kind of lost my nerve, and I quit the business. Um, I'd lost a couple of big clients, and uh, I was, I was working um, independently for Stern at the time, um, and Stern was a great client, um, but just doing um, you know, the Stern Pinball Sound wasn't enough to keep my business running, and I ended up uh, uh, leaving the business and going and trying to sell financial services uh, for about five or six years, and um, what the fuck was I thinking? <laughs> <coughs> my poor clients, I just can't believe it. Um, but it, it Things, things went, went okay for about four years, um, and then they began to deteriorate. And um, it was very clear that I was not going to succeed in the business. And, um, and, and I could kind of just feel my soul being sucked out of the bottom of my basement. And, um, and right about that time, uh, it was October of 2010, um, I got an invitation from Larry DeMar to, uh, to come out here for the, I guess, what would have been the 20th anniversary of the Adams Family game. And, um, and I thought, well, I hadn't been to Expo for you know, a few years at that point. I really was kind of really taking a break from games. And, uh, uh, but I decided I'd come. And um, a little did I know that he'd assembled the entire team, everybody who had anything to do with Adams, um, was there that night. Um, and it was in the giant hall at, at the Wesson. And, um, and I got there a little late, and, and Larry was on stage, uh, and Pat was on stage when I walked in the room. And I, and I walked in, and I just stood to the side to sort of like get the lay of the land and figure out what was going on. And I looked, and there was Larry and Pat up on the stage, and, you know, 35 or 40 of my colleagues were sitting in chairs off to the, you know, stage left. And, um, and I stood there, and I heard this buzz in the room. They were going, God damn, that, that's Graner, that's Graner. Yeah, it's Chris Graner. And I'm like, whoa, these guys know me, and I didn't even, you know, and I'm, they know me by sight, and I just walked in, and people know me. And I thought, wow, this is, you know, I, I remember this. I remember that this, you know, this is like, people like me here. <laughs> and, and that was cool. And, and Larry saw me, and he, like, you know, beckoned me over, and he, you know, had me sit in, the, in, this, in a seat. And, and then uh, a couple minutes later, and all he was doing was just kind of, you know, filtering people up on stage to tell stories about the game. Um, and I got to tell the story of how Arnold Schwarzenegger said, fuck you, asshole, to me. And I have it on tape. And, and, and <laughs> um, there, there never was a more appreciative audience for that story <laughs> than that crowd of a thousand pinheads, every one of which who had a T2 in their basement with the fuck you asshole ROMs installed. Everybody has those ROMs. Who doesn't have those ROMs, right? So it was a great story, and it was a really powerful moment, and I realized that I was home again. And it took me about, about three months from that point before Jack, uh, Jersey Jack um, approached me, or Dennis, really, Dennis and Greg approached me and, and, 
and invited me to come and, 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 and write you know, some music for that game. And, and I got to think to myself, do -do 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 follow the yellow brick road. And I thought, oh, that's just how the shooter groove should be. And in fact, that is how it went. So that was fun. And uh, it wasn't too much longer that Steve Kordak turned 100. And um, at his 100th birthday party, I ran into Brian Eddy. And Brian said, hey, well, Chris, we're going to call you. I go, what, why are you going to call me? Well, we're making this Facebook game, you know. And um, he goes, don't, go talk to Larry. And so I went over and talked to Larry. And he said, Larry, Larry do you, you know, Chris, do you want a, you want a full-time in-house job? And I said, yeah, well, yes, as a matter of fact, I do. And it took about eight months for, for that to happen. But um, I did end up coming to work for Spooky Cool. Um, and, I, and I had to choose between doing that and, and working for Jack. Um, and Joe and Brian's and Larry's offer was a little bit more real of an offer. And it's turned out to be pretty good. Um, I'm now the senior audio director for a division of Zynga that still makes the game that we invented back then. And I'm, I'm not sorry that I made that choice. Um, I, I miss Jack and I miss Keith and, and Ted and uh, um, you know, all the really great um, cats at, at, at Jersey Jack, but um, you know, it, was a, it was a good choice and it's working out for me okay. But um, uh, the, it, the fact is that pinball literally saved my life. Um, And, and so now I, now I come back every year, and, um, and, I, and I will come back, and um, people ask me um, whether or not I'm done with pinball. And um, the only thing that I can say is, I'll be back. <laughs> thank you, thank you very, very much. Thank you so, so much. Okay, folks, we're going to try to get this moving to Chris, we all love you. You will always be one of the best sound engineers, and I still always offer you a job. Um, real quick, we're going to get into service and support. Pinball Hall of Fame has a, r a record history of service and support. Those people who went the long distance to support an industry, not in the industry, but to support it, right? And that takes stuff out of them. One of the persons I was proud to induct earlier this year was Jerry Powers of Player One out of Toronto. Jerry Powers, in his long career with one company, which changed its names five times, promoted pinball in the course of 50 years. He made sure that pinball was there in Toronto all around and supported it through the dark times and the good times. So I was happy to induct Jerry Powers into the Pinball Hall of Fame for service and support. We would now like to ask Ray Tanzer to the stage. Hello, everybody. Wow, what an incredible group of people we all get the privilege of working with. I mean, all of these people coming up, how passionate we all are about our industry. Everybody deserves a round of applause. <laughs> so we have one more person to induct, I believe one more person. Um, they don't know that they're being inducted. Uh, LJ Green, if you can come up to the stand. seen him in a while. Huh? Seen you. <laughs> it's like 20 years, maybe yeah. more. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> okay. Good. So I hope I do it. I guess it. Yes. <laughs> so uh, LJ started her working uh, life during the heyday of pinball in 1990 
uh, with Williams Valley Midway as a market analyst. Sounds like a real fancy gig, but it consisted of running pinball location test programs and analyzing distributor performance. In 1992, things changed. She took on a role of Director of Marketing and International Sales at Gottlieb. This position was indeed a fancy gig, because in, in addition to organizing promotional events such as Pinball Expo and the Papa Tournament, uh, they were, she was responsible for licensing, developing, and launching the following pinball titles. Freddy Nightmare on Elm Street, Shack Attack, Stargate, Rescue 911, uh, The Big Hurt, Frank Thomas, Barbed Wire, and Waterworld. LJ left Gottlieb in 1995 and worked as an independent consultant in the game industry. And in that capacity, she wrote, the, uh, she wrote a pinball artwork quiz on behalf of Williams Bally for Pinball Expo 95. In fact, that was the last year LJ came to the Pinball Expo because she moved to Europe the following year. Today, LJ lives in the Netherlands, and while she still wears fashionable shoes, <laughs> and not her signature clogs for the expo this year, she is considered a part of the Dutch delegation. I had the privilege of working with LJ at Gottlieb, and therefore I have the honor of inducting her into the, I have to read this title because I wasn't familiar with it, uh, in commemoration of your induction into the Pinball Expo Service and Support Hall of Fame. Congratulations. <laughs> And this is quite surprising, and um, I have to I have to thank the Dutch delegation because it was, uh, in fact, Gerard from the or I have to say it properly, Gerard from <laughs> from the Dutch Pinball Museum in Rotterdam that convinced me to reconnect and come, and then and and then Rob called me, um, and I have to but one thing I do have to say, the person who hired me the first time is Kenny. Fedezna, and he's sitting here, and we were just laughing about my interview, which consisted of a couple of questions, and then the two sales guy going, fuck it, let's just go to Oinkers. That was it. <laughs> Hire her. That's it. That was Blatzpeeler. <laughs> and that was when I was 25, and, and this industry was really the... You all know it. It touches your heart. When I, I you know, I, when I saw Mark and immediately said, "How's Trudy?" Like, I, I, you're, you're in my mind, and I, I don't forget the names of the people that I met that I work for here. I, I, I even saw one guy that might have even been my brother-in-law had things gone another way when I was in my twenties <laughs> today. Um, and and it's funny because I've worked in a couple other, other industries and in a couple countries since since leaving this one. Nothing touches your heart like this business, and and. Um, Really blessed to see Chris yesterday, um, and and I, I like you said, th there's a certain feeling about coming home when you're here, and as a person who lives out of her home country, it feels it feels super, really heartwarming. And I thank you for this, and I thank you for, yeah, giving me the chance to to thank everybody for being a part of it. So yeah. <laughs>